<laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm unmuted now. <laughs> it's so I'm so excited to uh, have a conversation with everyone tonight. My name is Misa Dason. I'm a writer, educator, as well as a filmmaker and cultural anthropologist by training. And I'm so excited to moderate tonight's discussion with Shala Lynch, filmmaker and curator of the Moving Image and Recorded Sound at the Schomburg Center. Michael Gillespie, who's the Associate Professor of Film in the Department of Media and Communication Arts Arts and the Black Studies program at City College of New York, and Joe Skinner, who's a multimedia producer for the American Masters at the WNET group. And I want to just say it's a particular source of honor and joy to be talking with everyone tonight at the Schomburg in particular, because the Schomburg has been a place that has nurtured my educational and intellectual development since I was in middle school. And it was one of the first places that I had a job as a teenager when I was assisting the AV crew who recorded live events at the link in the Langston Hughes Auditorium. So I'm very happy to be here tonight with everyone. And so we only have about 30 minutes to process and discuss the story of Recorder that that, that Recorder tells us about Marion Stokes and her durational archival project which is to say that I'm inviting everyone, including ourselves to expect and accept a lack of closure with regards to all that there is to say and explore for this discussion. I know for myself, some points that I really wanna discuss in the future with anyone who's seen in the film is, you know, for example, how does gender, race, and sexuality shape who is and who is not afforded the status and recognition of being a genius in the time in which they live? And also, who exactly is this person named Marion Stokes, who was born in 1929 in the US, both Black and woman in difficult family circumstances, who was loyal to and embodied her political convictions and views of life that revolved around general themes of human freedom and freedom of speech. So like, how did she get to the place where she would not bend to the social pressures of the times that were asked of her and, and just stuck to who she was? So these are questions I wanna ask and if we can sprinkle them in the discussion, that would be great. But for tonight, I would like us to focus on the themes of media literacy, creating media archives, and what we can learn from Stokes and how we view the news today. And I'm thinking about that, and especially in light of the past two election cycles that we have all lived through, through the current climate crisis and a global uh, viral pandemic that we're still all trying to live through. And also, you know, the ongoing pandemic of racial terror violence that we have been living through for generations. And so with that, I want to open the discussion to all of my panelists here to ask, you know, in this moment, where many people these days receive their news from a variety of sources, whether it's from social media to daily digests from both traditional and non-traditional news media outlets, all of which create massive silos of information, right? What do you find consequential about Marion Stokes' project of archiving the content of network television right before the birth of the 24 hour seven news cycle and into what is probably the third or fourth iteration of digital media content creation? Who would like to start? I, I suppose I'll start, um, um, I, although I, I, I am thinking about Greek mythology and how the first person who steps off the boat is guaranteed to die, but hopefully that, that won't be the case tonight. Um, uh, so today I, I, I kind of randomly went through some of the programs of, of uh, some of the Marion Stokes collection, which has been uploaded on the Internet Archive. Um, I was really struck not only, particularly in terms of revisiting Nightline, uh, revisiting a kind of programming deeply devoted to journalism in terms of performing some kind of civic duty. Um, yes, of course, we are, we're also dealing with a period in which we're move, where newsrooms are moving more into the entertainment division, but it was quite stunning to see that kind of detail uh, and attention that was being given to the news, um, a kind of ethics around uh, journalism. Um, and then, you know, really rewatching the film and thinking about 
uh, you know, your, your opening comment about this, you know, this question around genius that her understanding of, the, of being in a period of time where that kind of rigor and attention was being uh, assaulted by kind of disposability that she felt on a most immediate level when she couldn't revisit her programs on input and kind of recognizing um, the, the degree to which all of this could be lost. Um, so it's that kind of, uh, it's it, the archive also to me kind of resonates with a sense of frustration and, but also uh, a, a great deal of forethought of, of needing to, to, to archive and preserve or, or that there might be a future in which people might want to have some kind of recollection. Yeah, I, I was so struck by her ability to know that corporate America would not keep <laughs> the artifacts of our lives. I, I mean, if we think about the Schomburg Center, you know, the reason we're here is because Arturo Schomburg uh, collected the vindicating evidences of Black history and culture because he was told it didn't exist. He was, it was an activism to collect counter to that and to create those evidences. And I was really struck by her ability to see that and to do that. Um, and then I loved that she had the resources to, because there's a really fine line between being crazy and social services, you know, taking you out of your apartment, which is packed to the gills and having the, being dubbed a collector of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that then has value and has value because she saw it, right? And is the evidences of um, our lives in this period, but also had value because her son understood it and didn't throw it all out, made it his mission too, to make sure that those materials were kept in storage, paid, in, paid for, right? And then found a home with the internet archive, which is amazing and astonishing that, you know, we can go online now and check out parts of her archive. And really her, her social and political history and leanings in the early part of the film, you know, it's so, it, it, it makes so much sense to me because in the archival community, um, after spending like some time in the archival community developing the American Masters Archive, you come to realize how important that kind of aspect is to to that community like you know this idea of democratizing information and creating access to it is so fundamental to those kinds of leanings that she had um, and creating a sense of community and and just giving people free public access to important materials and and something else i really love that they talk about later in the film is how uh prescient it was to be able to retrospectively look at the material because it's so true all archivists are you know they're they're preserving material so that you can see what's important about it later and she knew that just how important it was not for any specific moment per se but that somebody later will be able to find that exact moment and create the context and write about the context or or somehow point to that and say hey look we learned something now some 30, 40 years later about this material. And Joe, I'm really glad that you brought that up because one of the things that I thought about when I was watching the film is how, well, there was two things I thought, right? How easy it was for her to record because she had access to a TV and a VHS and Betamax and could just hit record. And then I also thought about how her son, you know, mentioned kind of in passing that when TiVo came out, she didn't want to record that way because she said she didn't want people to know what she was recording. And so I wanted to ask you, like, what is the digital recording equivalent of VHS and TV where people can on their own without anybody knowing what they're doing record? And I don't mean that in a, you know, like secretive way, but literally, you know, um, with the, your, you can have privacy of your information. How, how easy is it now in this moment to record, let's say network news um, uh, or record what you are reading on your various screens? That's such an interesting question because, you know, you'd think we live in this amazing time where it's so easy to 
preserve information and capture it. But a lot of archivists say that we actually live in a dark ages of, pres of preservation because, you know, it's so fortuitous that Marion was around in a time where she could record things directly to magnetic tape, uh, directly to a physical tape, which certainly degrades. I mean, we all know the way that VHS looks and has that kind of charming nostalgia to it. But really, that is an incredible uh, preservation tool of physical magnetic tape, because now most forms of uh, cheap democratized preservation are just saving files to your hard drive, which is a spinning disk, which is easily the most fragile tool for preservation. So nowadays in 2021, the way that institutions like ours preserve and the Library of Congress is they, they, they save everything to magnetic tape called LTO which is just like a more advanced form of a VHS in some ways. I mean, I'm, that's probably not entirely true, but it, but it's a physical tape. It's attempting to, to, to store something that doesn't involve moving parts like a hard drive. So it's actually some people worry that we're actually going to lose tons and tons of information um, from our current moment right now because there isn't because information because the Internet just exploded so rapidly. Uh, and exponentially, there was no real plan put in place along the way to preserve. Actually, my worry is, and it relates to Marion in the sense that archives are held hostage by corporate interests. So that you cannot actually access the artifacts of our past because you can't get into the networks or you know, um, the Schomburg you can, Library of Congress, you can, uh, the Internet Archive, there are places where you can, but for the most part, it is only seasoned researchers who, who get in, and not necessarily academics. So I would like to say to any of the academics that might be listening, right, that you are, are not worth your salt if you're doing 20th century American history culture without looking at media, right? That's one of the things that becomes clear when you're watching the textures from the 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 clips that are in this film and it just makes you realize that it is so important for understanding the tone and tenor of a moment and that is something she absolutely um was adamant about right and we have to admire her vision yeah i um i think i'm i'm i i, I I think what Joe had previously said has been kind of an open secret in my household in terms of my own personal hoarding around music and such, of, of, of trying to understand the ways that, um, you know, revisiting recorder is also, it resonated a great deal with me in terms of thinking of how there are comparable gestures around um, the not only the preservation, but also the building of archives that's been happening a bit in contemporary documentaries. Um, I'm thinking a great deal about uh, things like Yancey Ford's Strong Island. I'm thinking of Garrett Bradley's Time. I'm also thinking of a few other films in which there's seen, there were the process of creation of, of, the, of, the, of the film itself is also a question around archiving and memory. Uh, because indeed, there just does seem to be um, the, the amount of access that's made available to us in terms of understanding the past, um, the, the, the window seems to be closing every day. Yeah, I would expand that even further to say that every film is absolutely an archive. Um, even, even historical films are pulling from the past. Um, my own Chisholm, you know, I couldn't make a film about her run for Congress because there was no footage that existed. She was the first black woman elected to Congress and there was no footage, right? There's audio we discovered at the Schomburg. Um, so the film about, it becomes a film about her run for president because we could, I, we could find the evidence of, of that. And so it does skew our sense of history. And that's a conversation that really is important. If we can't see it, does it exist? Can we believe it? Do we feel it in the kind of multi-sensory way that becomes important for knowing history? Um, and, and that's something, uh, again, that, that, that Marion and her husband argued about and understood, and her second husband. <laughs> I was about to say, you're talking yeah. about the second. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the right, right, the right, second right. husband, he understood. <laughs> he right? understood. And maybe and the first husband understood too, and that's why. Left, right. So, so perhaps she was not, it was not being presented in the right package. I mean, I do think that um, 
we need to talk about uh, how she was in a sense marginalized because she, she she didn't come from a particular family. She didn't come, she didn't have the right gender, the right race for the kinds of ideas. Um, except what's wonderful about this story is it has such a happy ending that she finds her place as, as a misfit among misfits and is able to do this really wonderful visionary thing. But the whole time I'm watching the film, I'm like, if she had to work at McDonald's, this wouldn't have happened. If she had to, you know, work wherever, it wouldn't have happened. And so the resources allow us to see how privilege happens. Right. And she was a privileged woman of color. Mm. Nobody would have put up with that behavior if she weren't rich. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She was definitely a resident of the island of broken intellectual toys. That's that's for sure. I'm going to have to quote that. And I'm glad that was recorded. The island of broken intellectual toys. <laughs> oh. <laughs> And I mean, thank you for bringing that up too, because I was really struck by the fact that she felt um, an affinity to Steve Jobs, who we know had this, you know, completely celebrated as a genius, um, had a, a well-known infamous history of being a very difficult boss to work for, slightly, you know, maybe abusive. And that behavior was tolerated and maybe even kind of part of the magic around him because he was an innovator. And so Shala, thank you for bringing that up. You know, her wealth afforded her at least for people to tolerate the behavior. But um, I was struck also how the film starts off by immediately bringing up uh, the specter of craziness, you know, a little bit. Um, you know, that always, I guess, comes up with the idea of genius, but in how we first think about her, how it's so easy to kind of dismiss women and our intellect in the realm of hysteria or crazy, you know, because of gender. Yeah, but it was interesting. The wealth came up first. The The, the mm. opening basically says she was incredibly wealthy. This is, we would go to the house and, you know, et cetera. And I think yeah. there's a couple of shots of her, some cape and, you know, et cetera, her glamour fabulousness but and then she's crazy so it's the layering and the information and what we are then we become comfortable oh she's eccentric not a hoarder <laughs> right that was one of my favorite moments when they re um uh reshot you know, how she would just swoop into her car and sure. then her chauffeur richard i believe was kind of tickled himself saying it was like driving this daisy in reverse that was <laughs> a fun moment. Um, but I want to also, um, you all raised, like, my mind is going a lot of different ways about just different points that you brought up. But I guess, you know, thinking about the idea of the archive allows us to see what's important, you know, decades later. I'm curious to know, with the three of you, when watching Recorder, did it re make you rethink past moments in time regarding culture and news? Um, you know, so here for me, I'm thinking about uh, the ways that you saw the four channels of the 2001 Twin Tower attacks. And I remember when I first watched it, I was like, oh, I forgot Babyface was still like making music and videos around that time. Like, why was that the first thought that popped into my head when I also am anticipating this moment that brought me back to where I was when I first heard the news? But then I also was thinking about um, you know, I was a kid when Magic Johnson announced his HIV status and uh, retiring from the Lakers and how it was a big deal. And, it, you know, I was watching that being like, oh, you know, people need to kind of remember, I, you know, now that HIV and AIDS are livable diseases, I think it's very easy for my generation and younger to forget that there was a moment that it was sensationalized when somebody revealed um, their HIV status. Not to say that there's still not stigma, but it's not how it was 30 plus years ago. So, you know, in thinking about the advertisements that you saw about, have you been um, discriminated against based your gender and race? Like, you know, and thinking about how everyone's throwing the word intersectionality around, but at the time, like that, you know, understand the importance and the impact of Kimberly Crenshaw's article when it came out and thinking about uh, what that really meant. So, these are just some things I was thinking about and I want, I was interested to know if anything struck you. Also, you know that the Cosby Show series finale happened the same time that the Rodney King uprisings were happening. I didn't think about that, you know, so 
but if nothing struck you, we can move on. <laughs> um, I I could I could speak a little bit of that. I mean the the it's such a significant period uh, in which she's recording, um, and you know it's it's not just the film itself. It's that the film you know has definitely compelled me to revisit the archive. Uh, online a great deal. I think I was, I was talking about this earlier of, you know, her argument or um, her justification at the start about realizing that the narrative around the Iranian, uh, the Iran hostage crisis was, was clearly being shifted around this question of were they uh, in terms of uh, the, the erasure of the fact that there might've been some CIA agents among those, right? Um, I was struck in revisiting the archive online and seeing the coverage of the coup before America eventually went into uh, Panama and, and the kind of discussion around, um, there's a certain obviousness that we know about the egregiousness of American foreign policy in Latin America at this time, <laughs> from the Reagan to the Bush years. But it's interesting to see how the, the kind of coverage that was given to that, while at the same time, um, the press giving us all of the information, but not necessarily explicitly speaking to that point. Um, I'm also struck by the, the uh, ever-growing reports about the possibility that homelessness might be a problem in the future. Um, I'm also struck by looking back at that footage of Jay Leno on The Tonight Show and discovering, wow, he was never funny. But, uh, you know, these various factors like that, <laughs> uh, that it is such an incredibly rich archive for us to have available. So I want to pull back just a little bit. I mean, what I find is I love the name record, right? She's the recorder. But there's all in every community, there is the 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 person who collects for that community. Um, and it's in various formats, depending on what time we are in the, um, wh where we are technologically. So what is amazing is she captures this moment as we're going from analog into digital. And she captured this moment in terms of um, certain subjects at how the media was portraying them. And it's, we go from a few stations to a multitude of stations. Like there would be no way for her to continue. Like she passed at the right moment for her mission. <laughs> so I, I wanna say that, but I also wanna say that there are throughout history folks that are doing this and collecting and that's exactly what becomes the archives. And to do it in a way where you're not editing you're collecting because you can't know what's important and you leave it there for future generations to look back and to review and to rewrite, right? It, it's what allows us to have historiography, which is so important if you're a person of color and a woman, you gotta go look back and reclaim yourself to bring, <laughs> bring your narrative forward, right? And I was also just going to add quickly to what Shalu was saying about that perfect period of time that she was capturing, you know, there were a lot of channels, but it was still kind of culturally monolithic, the cable news networks. And today to do something similar to that would mean you'd have to cover Twitch and Twitter and Instagram. It would be basically impossible. So I really, I'm so grateful that she captured a period in our cultural history where you really could see the main sort of monoculture perspectives on the main issues and compare them and contrast them. I do want to make a shout out for the Vanderbilt News Archive for any of you who want to go watch the news. They actually started recording the news from 68 or 69, the nightly news every night and then news specials and then added CNN in. And it is largely publicly accessible where you can watch the broadcast and the commercials, you know. And following up, oh, Michael, did you want to add something? No, no, I was just, I'm just really glad to, that Shala had said that. Me too. And I want to just bring in a, a question that I think is relevant also in this, for this particular conversation from audience, uh, from Jalen, who wants to know, you know, how would you recommend how we, the average person, can archive media content in a sustainable way? 
Joe, I'm going to let you go. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, you probably have a lot smarter things to say on this than I do, but you know, it's such a sliding scale. I think do what's affordable first. And then I think the first place I would look to is the cloud set up, like buy the $2 upgrade to your, your Google drive. Um, unfortunately I have to point to a corporate outlet because I don't really know, you know, nonprofit sources, maybe Shala has good ideas for that. But in terms of uploading to a cloud setup, I think that's a really safe way since they're constantly merging and migrating their hard drives. Um, that's probably what I would say is like the easiest way or thumb drives, some some non spinning disks. Yeah, I would second setting up a system where you can migrate. I mean, we're all having to become archivists because we create so much um, that is on our hard drives. Um, so being able to archive, being able to access it in the future. And I do, this brings us back to the beginning of the conversation because I worry about technology changing so fast that the software is not available and you know the hardware isn't available to access um, our photos and videos. But Twitter will have it, Snapchat will have it. And you know, the other side of that worry is in 50 years, our grandkids will be watching whatever you would watch or interact with. And you know, those corporations will have sold their archives and all of our personal videos, all of our personal moments, Facebook will be there for another corporate entity to chop up and add into a, a moving commercial for the next hot thing. Yeah, I actually wanted to highlight um, a conversation that I've been listening to with Toshi Regan and Adrian Marie Brown on their podcast, Octavia's Parables, where they ask questions like, well, you know, are people things, you know, especially the intellectual production that happens on social media through Facebook posts, Instagram and Twitter. And so one of the things that they brought up was like, well, if it's really important to you, do you have another way of how you've archived what you just posted? Do you have it copied somewhere? Because what happens if one day you can't get into Facebook or Facebook um, goes away? And I kind of also want to then also uplift, um, uh, what's her name, uh, Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums and her uh, book, M Archive, which I blows my mind. I'm, I'm slowly working through it, but at one point, she brings up in this you know, far future where the internet doesn't exist. And so everyone has to rely on pen and paper again. I might be you know, stoned <laughs> for making a plug Spoiler. for pen and paper, <laughs> but I just wanna, I, I, for me, they're very thought provo provoking ways to think about at the end of the day, is, should a, um, an argument still be made for keeping a physical copy of the things that we hold dear? Amen. Uh, let's 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 uh, let's let's keep our penmanship sharp. Uh, let's let's still remember how to make a photo album. Uh, just kind of these kind of old school skills, I think, might be uh, will definitely come in handy in the future. I second. Third. Yeah. <laughs> there. <laughs> You're here. <laughs> this we is not a, a very good We have a for, quorum up for the future. This is terrible for Mary and Stokes' story. We're supposed to be arguing viciously, but politely, and respecting one another. You know, it is all about the good argument. I, I might I might hold a grudge against all of you tomorrow. So it'll, it'll, <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll be fine. <laughs> So we have five minutes remaining. I wanna invite any more questions from the audience, but I also wanna open up the floor uh, to the panelists if there was anything that we haven't discussed so far that you wanted to just throw out there for um, things to think about moving forward when we think about Marion Stokes' work, but also the archive. Well, I do wanna talk about the, the, the difficulty and the cost related to archiving. I mean, most institutions would have looked at the enormous amount of material and been like, oh, we cannot possibly deal with this. Um, and so there is a real cost to saving our culture and to making it accessible. And that is just an important point to understand um, that these institutions, we exist to collect culture, but we need your help to do it. We need your help in a couple of ways to sometimes folks just have to donate. <laughs> we can't buy everything, <laughs> number one. 
right? And number two, that there is this big cost associated with the preservation and then the access. Absolutely. I mean, the, the American Masters Archive took us seven years uh, to digitize and create access for it. Um, and that was a lot of money, not to go into the exact numbers right now, but it, it's a big endeavor. And there's some organizations, granting organizations that can give you the money. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a tremendous effort to get this kind of stuff seen. Um, my big worry really is, is, is creating that access. Um, I'm really grateful that Marion's uh, collection has that captioning in there. That's such a lucky accident um, because the metadata, that description for the material is really, is really what makes it so you can find it in the archives. Um, and any archive, that's really the most important part of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the, I, I think about the number of times that I've come across, uh, stumbled across some material in a library or in somebody's attic uh, and just wondered about, do I have the capacity on my own individual level to do some kind of measure of preservation? And in most cases, I don't. I don't have the room or I don't necessarily have the resources available. And some of these things that still kind of haunt me, particularly books that I've never seen again, where I had an opportunity to, yeah, I should have picked up that book at that time. Um, and, you know, just to kind of reiterate what both of you have said, there's, uh, it's, it's about, at sometimes you yourself are the collector um, and it's good to have an ally who's a grant writer. It's, so don't necessarily feel as though you have to multitask in that way. You find yourself a good grant writing partner, you just keep digging. And I also just wanted to add, going back to Shala's point um, about support, you know, there's a huge industry of blogs and uh, news programs around, you know, building wealth and how you just will like automate uh, deductions, uh, you know, through your salary, uh, towards your savings and all your different pots. And so I also want to put a plug, just automate monthly donations and like the increments that make sense for you instead of waiting for the end of the year, just make it part of an automated um, financial supporting system. That's my personal opinion, uh, but I think that helps a lot too. Um, and with that, I think we are at time. Um, thank you so much for joining us. This conversation will be available to watch again tomorrow on the Schomburg Center's YouTube channel. And um, I really enjoy talking with you all. Michael, Shala, Joe, thank you for joining us tonight. And looking forward to part two of this, that, this conversation and more in the future. Uh I look forward to being at a time where we could all get together at Red Rooster afterwards. Yes. <laughs> yes. And thank you for moderating the panel. My only regret is we didn't have enough of a good argument. Like next time we should have planned, you know, I mean, if we're going to be true to the story, we should have really gone to the mat about something and huffed <laughs> off, huff. <laughs> okay, maybe next time. Yeah. Next time. Get a haircut. That's ah! what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Go get hair. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. All right. Be well, everyone. And good night. Thank you to our audience as well. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.